this morning. So good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Amen. I want to lift up a few announcements this morning. I'm uh, so glad all of you are here in worship. Um, got some visitors. I'm not going to embarrass you guys, make you come forward and tell your life story, uh, but we're so glad you're here. Patrick and Jennifer. Okay. <laughs> well, um, so good to be in the house. Well, what a beautiful day. Uh, kind of a sweaty day, right? I mean, the humidity, everyone is damp and wet. Oh, man. And so as you walk outside and you start to sweat, just remember your baptism and be thankful, okay? <laughs> so uh, got a few announcements we want to lift up this morning. Thank you to everyone who came yesterday to the meet and greet for Ryan and Lindsay and Emerson. Uh, they were just blessed to see everyone here and to meet you all, and they are excited about coming to Huntsville and Presley Chapel. Uh, we are sad to be leaving. And it's, it's been five wonderful years of ministry with you. And uh, you all are a blessing to us. And we have just been so blessed to be here working alongside you in this wonderful community, Huntsville, Madison County. What a, what a wonderful place to live. And uh, we are truly blessed. Kelly and Emily will get to enjoy Huntsville for another year on and off. Uh, and they'll be coming over to Clinton on the weekends, and I'm excited about that. Uh, but um, they'll be around, and Allie and I'll be coming over occasionally. Uh, but, you know, God is so good, and uh, I believe God will bless us, and this will be a time of, uh, of just really seeing God's grace work. Um, transitions are tough. Transitions are difficult, but God is with us, and I know that that uh, God will be faithful. And so, uh, thank you. There will be a potluck today, uh, this afternoon, right after church, and that will be at, at Withrow Springs State Park. So the upper pavilion. Now that is the pavilion on Highway 23, correct? Okay, Highway 23, the upper pavilion. Um, I'm looking at the clock, and we're down to about a five-minute sermon right now, so I need to hurry. Um, Father's Day is next Sunday, June 20th, So, uh, and then Vacation Bible School, want to mention that, June 21st, 22nd, and 23rd, from 5.30 p.m. until 7.30 p.m., that will be at Presley Chapel United Methodist Church. Uh, we partner with Presley Chapel and the Presbyterian Church every year. It rotates, and we're back out at Presley. I'm excited about Vacation Bible School uh, this year. God's Wonderland is the theme, and so it's going to be fun, kids. Invite your friends. Uh, Huntsville United Methodist will provide a meal. God's Wonder Lab, sorry. Um, God's Wonder Lab. It'll still be great. Right? Uh, so, and that's the point. Uh, so Huntsville is providing a meal. What night did we decide? Hunts Monday. Monday night. So okay. So if you want to make a donation, that would be the best thing to do. Uh, make a donation, a cash donation to the church. Write a check, whatever, and uh, someone else will take care of purchasing the food. So yes, you're excited to be here. I'm so glad. 
What's going on? <laughs> he was his eyes that were when he saw the woman. So give a little contribution and we'll make it happen. So on Monday the 21st. But BBS is going to be exciting. It's so good to be able to come back and do children's activities and youth activities and Bible studies and worship together, right? And so we're excited about that. Speaking of children's ministries, we've got a playground that's almost ready. Thank you, Dale. Thank you, Phil, Jim, Jim. Uh, who are some of the other ones who have been helping out? Uh, yes, Gerald. Thank you, Gerald. Uh, they've done a wonderful job putting that playground equipment together. Um, you know, when we purchased that equipment, they wanted to know if we wanted to spend $650, $700 to put it together. And we were like, nah, we can throw it together in no time. And I think every one of us has questioned that decision at some point. But uh, under Dale's faithful leadership, uh, he has read the instructions page. By, how many pages are in that instruction? We are now on step 53 of 60. So we only have six. Okay, 53 of 60 steps. And I think there's like 200 pages of instructions. So it's, it's just been... Uh, a mountain to overcome but they've done a great job it's sitting down here uh, we're going to hire a, a 18 wheeler and a roll off or something to get it over to the playground right uh, we've got to haul it over there we'll lift it up and carry it uh, but uh, it's going to be fun for our kids Carla did you want to say anything else about children's ministries okay we are downstairs the next week we will be there all right. Next week we'll be downstairs for the children children's time. Yes. Okay. This week also. So Tuesday afternoon at one o'clock, we're going to work on the playground equipment again. I just want everybody to know. Tuesday at one. So playground crew, you have been notified. All right. Men's breakfast is Saturday, June 26th at eight o'clock a.m. at Presley Chapel. Men, come and be a part of that. It will be great food and great fellowship, I can guarantee you. So uh, looking forward to that time of fellowshipping together. I can't think of any other announcements. Am I missing anything? Bible study, Wednesday night. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, there were six ladies in attendance Wednesday night at Bible study. Had a great group, ladies. We would love for you to join Catherine and and her group in Bible study, they're doing the book of Proverbs right now, going through the book of Proverbs. And it sounded like they were having a great time. We had youth going on at the same time on the other end of downstairs. And uh, so wonderful opportunity for you to be a part of a small group and to study God's word. And I'm gonna talk about that in my sermon today. So we've got a birthday, a couple birthdays to lift up. And, um, and we're gonna sing happy birthday today. Okay, we're going to start singing happy birthday and happy anniversary again. So I invite you to do that. I want to make one note real quick uh, before we move on to birthdays. Uh, for our hymns today, we're going to sing the first and last verses of each hymn. Okay? Whitney? Okay. All right. My birthday. Uh, your birthday on behalf of, yes, gotcha. Okay. All right. So first and last hymn, uh, verses on our hymns today. Uh, so, here we are. Happy birthday to Courtney Spurlock and Stephanie Casey. Um, did you want to say something? Make a speech I, on I that? Do, I do. Let's just say I'm putting a dollar in today. Okay. <laughs> That's what All right. Courtney and Stephanie have a birthday on the 17th. So, 17th. Is that right, Fern? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> she what? 50 years each. 50 years young. Either. Fern disclosed that information. <laughs> so I'm just passing it along. Yes. I remember it well. You remember it well. <laughs> What's that, Dr. Whiting? Well, isn't that Dr. Whiting? Yeah. I and remember it well. <laughs> Dr. Whiting remembers it as well. Too. <laughs> All right, Fern, and how blessed your kids are to have you as a mother. You are a wonderful, wonderful person. We love you. All right. 
So we need to sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Amen. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Holy God, we give you thanks for this day. The sunshine. The air that we are breathing. We give you thanks for your grace and your presence with us on this day. You are a good God. You are a faithful God. And as your people who have gathered here today, we ask, O oh God, that you would truly open our hearts and our minds as we enter into this time of worship. That you would be glorified through the hymns we sing and through the word that is proclaimed. That you would bind us together as your people. That in this time of worship, we would experience your grace and your spirit in a way that nurtures our souls. Be with us and help us to truly open our hearts this day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I think I'm just going to stand right here. And I invite you to stand as you are able. Stand in body or in spirit. And join with me in our call to worship. The words are on the screen as well. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is a day of new beginnings. This is the time for growing into new disciples for Jesus. Come, let us prepare ourselves for worship. Let us be prepared for service to God. Amen. Please remain standing and join together as we sing our opening hymn, My Jesus, I Love Thee. It's number 172 in our United Methodist hymnals. The words are also on the screen. We will sing the first and last verses. seated. We are continuing a sermon series this week. The sermon series is about, oh I'm sorry, skipping children's time. Come forward for children's time. All the children who would like to come forward, I'm so sorry. I get in this rhythm and we haven't done children's time. And we told the children we were doing children's time. So thank you, Gerald. Or I'd have been in trouble with these children, huh? Come sit down. And your wife. Sit down. Guess what today is? We're picnicking. Do you like picnics? Where you take your food and you eat outside and slap bugs? Right, right. Well, today we're talking about picnics because 
Picnics have been going on for a long time. I mean, a long time. Did you know Jesus had a picnic? A new day called Christmas the daycare, the daycare that she's going to is big also. Okay, so Jesus was walking around with his disciples, and they were going places, and they had gone to a real remote area. That means that there was not any towns around. It means a long time ago there wasn't a lot of towns around. So there wasn't a lot of towns around. But as always, when Jesus was talking and telling stories, people wanted to come and hear him. So, they were there. They had ran to this remote area to hear Jesus. And they had been there all morning long. And they had been there through lunch. And it was getting late in the afternoon. And guess what? People were getting hungry. And the disciples, when Jesus took a break, they took him aside and they said, you know, these people out here are getting really, really hungry. And we don't have any food to feed them. And there's not any food. So it is too far for us to walk into town to get more food. So Jesus said, well, let's feed them. And they said, we don't have the money to feed all of these people. There's now 5,000 people here. That's a lot more people than are here, right? 5,000. It's a lot of people to feed. So he said, let's see what we can do. So the disciples spread out with baskets, and they came back to Jesus. And Jesus said, well, what'd you come up with? And they said, yeah, this is what we came up with. They came up with, what did we come up with? This is a fish. And another fish. That was it. Two fish. And there was some bread. There was one, two, three, four, five pieces of bread. What in the world are they going to do with just five pieces of bread and two fish? I could eat that, couldn't you? Well, Jesus said, let's do this. So he raised the basket up to heaven, and he said, Father in heaven, thank you for this food. Please bless us Hi. with the nourishment from it, Hi. and let it be plentiful for all of the people here. And then he put the basket down and said, fill your baskets up. So, here's a basket for Harper. Here's a basket. Judith, here's your basket. And here's a basket shh, for Izzy. Is there stuff in those baskets? Here's a basket shh, for Keely. And shh, basket for you. Come get your basket. Would you pass it to him, Keely? He might be kind of scared. Pass it to his dad, and then his dad can give it to him. Okay, now your job is to go feed all the people. So give them. Oh, yeah, take the baskets out there and feed them. Go take them. Izzy, go take it. Go take it out there. Here you go. Go take your baskets out, and we're going to feed the people. Here, can you give the feet? Give, give a piece of bread to her. Okay. <laughs> this is a little unsure. Usually my kids are a little bit bigger. <laughs> Did you run out of food? Jim was on yours, wasn't he? <laughs> should have known, should have known. And when y'all come back up here, we're going to say our prayer and end for the day. Izzy, can you run back up here and then you can give the fish back later? Well, no, maybe we can. We'll go ahead and say our prayer, okay? And then we'll go downstairs. You ready? Got your fish? All right. You can just leave baskets wherever they fall and we'll round them up later. <laughs> All right, here we go. Dear Jesus, thank you for wonderful days of picnics and for blessing food so abundantly for us. Guide us, fill us with your wisdom and your knowledge and your joy and bring us back next week to learn even more about you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Let's go downstairs and play.
God's children said, Amen. Amen. We are in the middle of a sermon series, actually the second week uh, of our sermon series on reaching our God-given potential and becoming all that God has called us to be as individuals and as the church, as individual followers of Jesus and as the church. And so today we're talking about growth. Uh, next week we'll be talking about stewardship and then the final week we will talk about outreach and how we can reach our God-given potential in all those different areas. Uh, I was going to use the second chapter of Colossians as my uh, scripture reference for today, the text for my sermon, but I'm going to cut that down and just share one verse from that passage with you, from that chapter. And it is uh, Colossians chapter 2, uh, Paul's letter to the church at Colossae, chapter 2, verse 6. Hear these words. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. May God bless the reading, hearing, and understanding of this portion of God's holy word. This is the good news for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh God, speak through me or in spite of me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. John Wesley talked about going on to perfection. And when we talk about growing as disciples of Jesus Christ, that's really what we're talking about is going on to perfection, at least as we understand it as uh, Methodist Christians. Most of us are Methodists, uh, Wesleyan Christians, uh, going on to perfection. And we hear that phrase often in the United Methodist Church. I know I've preached several sermons in my five years here about sanctifying grace and about going on to perfection. Uh, when Wesley was talking about perfection and going on to perfection, he was talking about being perfected in love, having a heart that was being transformed by the work of the Holy Spirit, the work that the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives. We learn about grace in confirmation class. Uh, usually it's sixth grade for United Methodists uh, where we talk about prevenient, justifying, and sanctifying grace. And as a United Methodist seminary student, uh, a student who uh, went to seminary and learned about what it means to be a pastor, um, I attended a Cumberland Presbyterian seminary uh, in Memphis, and we had a Wesleyan House of Studies, Methodist House of Studies, where we took special classes on the Wesleyan doctrine and polity. And so I had to write many papers about grace, about God's grace, and, and, and demonstrate to my professors that I had a, a decent understanding of what uh, grace is all about from a Wesleyan perspective, justifying, prevenient first and justifying and sanctifying grace. Prevenient grace being that grace that goes before, uh, grace, the grace of God that's there when we're not even aware of it. And, and then justifying grace is when we are made righteous, when, when we are justified in the eyes of God, when we decide to follow Jesus and we repent of our sins and we turn and we follow Jesus, we are justified. We are uh, made right in the eyes of God. But it doesn't end there. And, and there's what Wesley called sanctifying grace. And that's where we talk about being perfected in love. It's that ongoing work of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's that grace that helps us grow as Christians, God working in our lives, the Holy Spirit transforming our hearts and our lives as we go through this journey of faith. And I think it's a beautiful way for us to think about faith as Christians. So often we think, and in so often, let me just say that. So often we think that when we pray a sinner's prayer, 
we repent and we we accept Jesus in our heart that that's it we're good we're saved but that's not the end it's only the beginning really because God is ready to do an incredible work in our lives and if we look at the example of the disciples, they were constantly growing and, and facing challenges to their faith. And Christ was working in their lives to, to mold them and transform them into faithful disciples. And we can see how they grew in their lives. This morning, I want to share with you uh, a little description of what I've just talked about. And uh, you know, I learned first about it in Sunday school and, and then again in seminary about justifying prevenient and sanctifying grace. But you can also go to umc.org. Isn't that cool? And you can learn about what all we believe as United Methodists. You just go to your computer or your smartphone and type in www.umc.org. Now, I've done that work for you today, but I encourage you to go and look at some of the resources that are available. And it's an opportunity for you to learn, really, what do we believe? Because we hear that all the time, right? When we're out and about, folks ask us. I know they ask me all the time. Now, what's the difference between a Methodist and a Baptist? And so a lot of times I'll say, go check out umc.org. Most of the time I tell them, you know, we're a whole lot closer than we are different. We share a lot of the same, but we do have different, distinct uh, ideas about God and our worship practice is a little different and our theology, our sacramental theology, and our understanding of baptism. So anyway, it can turn into a really long and interesting conversation. But... Here's what I want to share with you this morning from umc.org. Sanctifying grace draws us toward Christian perfection, which Wesley described as a habitually filled with the love of God, as habitually filled with the love of God and neighbor, and as having the mind of Christ and walking as he walked. Let me read that again. Sanctifying grace draws us toward Christian perfection, which Wesley described as a heart habitually filled with the love of God and neighbor and as having the mind of Christ and walking as he walked. Wesley took seriously uh, Jesus' invitation to be ye therefore perfect as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. From Matthew 5, 48. By perfection, Wesley did not mean moral flawlessness or sinlessness. He meant perfection in the sense of maturity. Wesley believed we could become perfect in love in this life if Jesus invites us to seek perfection, perfect love is possible. He didn't mean we would be free from mistakes, from temptation, or from failure. I don't believe it either. I believe we're gonna have struggles. We're gonna struggle at different times in our lives with temptations. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to fall short of the glory of God. For Wesley, growing as a Christian is all about being filled with love, which happens by the grace of God. We are often told, and Jesus told us, right? Love your neighbor. Sometimes that's difficult, isn't it? It's really difficult. Why did Jesus have to be so challenging? Who is my neighbor? Remember the story of the Good Samaritan? You know, it's tough. It's tough to love our enemies. It's tough to love our neighbors sometimes. And I would say that as a follower of Jesus, if we're struggling to love others, especially those we may disagree with or who disagree with us, if we're having a hard time loving others, loving our neighbor, those who are different, those who come against us, then I believe we need to pray that God would transform our hearts and give us that perfect love 
I love that part about being habitually filled with the love of God and neighbor and is having the mind of Christ and walking as he walked. Habitually filled with the love of God and neighbor, having the mind of Christ. You know, as we go through life as disciples of Jesus, there are times when we really do need to pause. We need to stop and reflect upon where we've been, where we started, where we've been, and where we are now, right? And if it doesn't look much different, where we started to where we are now, if we're not more loving and more tender and more willing to extend grace, to the least of these, then I wonder if we're really growing as followers of Jesus. There should be a transformation that's taking place in our hearts and in our lives. And it happens over time and, and we may not be aware of it. When I reflect upon my life, I'm not the same man I was 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, one year ago. Last week, thank God, I'm not the same I was then. I believe God is working in my heart and my life. Does that mean I've arrived, that I've reached Christian perfection? I don't think so because every now and then the Holy Spirit will speak to me and say, Brad, you need to be more loving towards this person. You need to check your attitude. You need to check where your heart is on this. And so I believe God is still working. On me and I believe I still fail from time to time I'm just being transparent I'm being honest Kelly don't hallelujah right now <laughs> she can testify but it's one of those things where we look back and we might feel discouraged man I'm just struggling in my faith but we look back and we say wow I've come a long way I may not be where I want to be where I believe God is calling me, but I'm not the same person I was back there. And that's evidence of God working in our heart and our life, making us more compassionate, more tender, more loving to others, especially to those who are hurting and downtrodden, the poor and the oppressed and those who are weak and those whose society often just wants to write off. God gives us something and it's gotta be God given. We can't manufacture it. If we don't feel it, if we don't feel the love, then we don't have the love of God. Those are hard words, aren't they? I'm preaching to myself, y'all. I'm preaching to myself. We can't manufacture. We can't make it up. That love of God that, that God gives us, that the Spirit gives us, that grace, it transforms our hearts where we just can't contain it. It just flows. We may stumble in how we express that love and we may fall short, but God will speak to us and say, uh-huh, see, you need to straighten up over here. Does that make sense? I believe that's the way God works. When I think about growing in our faith and growing as a disciple of Christ, I, I think about that and I, I think about, you know, the way... Our girls have grown over the years and how they're not the same as they were one time. Thank goodness we're not still changing their diapers, right? That was a job, y'all, wasn't it? Some of y'all are closer to that than we are right now. Um, maybe one day we'll have grandbabies and we'll get to experience that joy again. Changing those diapers. <laughs> We shouldn't be wearing spiritual diapers either, should we? Right? God is calling us to grow up, to grow into Christ, to live and to love as Christ lived and loved. I started to talk about how, you know, I changed my girls' diapers when they were little, and one day they may have to change mine. And, and Kelly said, you don't need to say that. And I just did. <laughs> Sorry, Kelly. Growing. growing. And that's the reality too, though, isn't it? We're going to need people to care for us physically, right? One day. And so we need to make sure we care for others 
physically. I hope I did a good enough job caring for my girls that they won't resent having to care for me one day. Mm. And so the same thing spiritually. We need to help others. Not be so judgmental and so proud of where we are spiritually, where we have grown to, that we look down on those who aren't quite there yet. I hope we're looking forward at examples of people who are beyond where we are. I think of my great grandma, Athy Jane Bradshaw, and how she was the closest thing to perfect I've ever known. Perfect love. I'm talking about loving people. And what a great role model she was. And how she poured that into our lives and nurtured us and helped us. And I want to be like my great grandma. I want to have that faith she had. And so I look to her and I look to others, other examples. I should look to Jesus first, right? And that's really what, what Paul is talking about here. He's talking about um, keeping our eyes focused on Jesus. He's writing to a church that is struggling because some false teachers have come in and and they're elevating the angels above Jesus. They're worshiping angels. And they've taken their eyes off of Jesus, the incarnate Christ. And they're teaching those in the church that they should worship the angels, that, that Jesus isn't all Jesus said he was. And Paul is fighting for the church. He's saying, no, you've got to hold on to Jesus. Jesus, not only is Jesus the Lord of the universe, He's the Lord of the angels as well. He's the Lord of all things. He was there in the beginning at creation. So keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep rooted in Christ, right? If you want to grow as a church. The psalmist in Psalm 92, 12 says, flourish like a palm tree and grow like a cedar of Lebanon. The cedars of Lebanon, those, those cedars over there in Lebanon grow to about 100 feet or so and they're massive and they're, they're majestic and they're beautiful. Depending on how you measure it, the largest plant in the world is the aspen tree, the populus tremuloides. An aspen grows in stands of what look like individual trees, but the trees are actually stems that are connected to each other by a common root system. One such aspen plant in the Wasatch Mountains of Utah is known to have produced 47,000 stems covering an area of roughly 110 acres. The entire organism is estimated to weigh more than 13 million pounds. It's incredible. Measuring by height rather than weight or area, the largest plant in the world is the coast redwood sequoia. Y'all seen the sequoias? Been out there and seen them in person? I haven't, but I really want to one day. They've been known to climb to a height of 379 feet. This is the size of a 38 story skyscraper. And then the world's smallest flowering plant is the Wolfia globosa, a rootless plant belonging to the duckweed family. A single wolfia plant is less than 1 42nd of an inch long. It weighs about 1 190,000 of an ounce, roughly the same as two grains of table salt. It is so small that 5,000 individual plants could be packed into a thimble. The flower produced by each plant is of course even smaller, a microscopic pistil and stamen inside a small cavity. The wolfia also produces the world's smallest fruit, which is called a utricle. They don't sell those in Walmart. <laughs> the plant is found in quiet freshwater lakes and marshes around the world. But what do all these plants have in common? They grow, right? They grow. They start out small, little seeds, and they grow into something marvelous and beautiful if they've got good roots. Paul is reminding Christians in the church, the Colossians, 
is reminding us to stay rooted in Christ if we are going to grow. How do we stay rooted in Christ? I'm almost finished. I'm doing pretty good, actually. I don't know how long I've been preaching, but I'm watching the clock. I don't want anybody to eat all the deviled eggs out there. So. How do we stay rooted in Christ? We come together and worship, right? It's not about who we get to see this week to see what they're wearing or what they're driving maybe this week or to be able to share the gossip about what's going on. No, it's about coming together in worship as brothers and sisters in Christ as sinners in need of God's grace. It's about the family, the fellowship we have here rooted in Christ, worshiping together, confessing our need of Jesus together. It's about searching the scriptures. Not, I didn't say reading my Bible. Reading the Bible is good. There was a time when I used to read my Bible. I'd break it out and I'd say, okay, I need to do my devotions. I'm going to read one chapter and I'd get to reading and I'd read maybe 15 or 20 verses and say, okay, that sounds like enough. I think I've done my due diligence. I've spent time with the Lord. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about searching the scriptures. I'm talking about digging into the word of God. Seeking God through the scriptures, praying that God would open our hearts and our minds as we turn to God's word, as we turn open the pages of the Bible and we read the stories. And I think it's important to point out, too, that as we search the scriptures and read and study the Bible, it's important to, to do so prayerfully, but it's also important to bring in commentaries and, and to listen to other perspectives, to open our hearts and our minds to what God may be saying through other voices. Now they tell us when we're preparing a sermon, before you go to the commentaries, read through the scripture three times prayerfully and allow God to speak to you and then go to the commentaries. They don't say don't go to the commentaries. Commentaries are a great tool. They're great online commentaries. I encourage you to do that. Be very intentional in studying the Word of God. And if you need help finding good commentaries, I'll help you. I've got some in that office right there that you can borrow at any time, and some folks have. But read and study the Scriptures. Allow the Scriptures to read you. We all come to the scriptures with our own experiences. And we, as we read the scriptures, they may speak to us differently than they do to someone else. And I've experienced that in study groups. And maybe you have too, Catherine, in this study of Proverbs. That's one of the things you ladies do is read and how does this speak to you, right? And you hear different stories about how the word of God is speaking <clears throat> We stay rooted when we serve the poor. When we open our hearts and our lives to those who are without the resources they need to live. Rather than judging them, we open our hearts and our pocketbooks to those who are struggling. Serving the poor. Visiting the sick. When we put ourselves in a place where we are ministering to the sick, often we are ministered to when we hear their testimonies of God's grace and faithfulness. Wesley called those the means of grace. When we come to the table and we break bread together and we remember that sacrifice Jesus made for us, we remain rooted in the faith. Christ meets us at this table and through, through God's amazing grace, we experience some kind of supernatural transformation when we reflect upon our Jesus dying for us. Bread, his body broken for us. Juice, his blood poured out for us. 
when we really enter into those times in a spirit of worship, transformation, to transform our lives. And so Paul reminds us, reminds these early Christians how important it is to stay rooted and how important it is to grow together in God's grace. And isn't that really what life is all about? Continuing to grow, right? We want to grow. We don't want to remain stagnant, stay where we are. We want to grow. Faith is the same. And the mark of maturity vis-a-vis -vis the Christian faith is about an openness to continue growing in Christ, a heart that is open to loving and living like Jesus. And so may we experience growth. May we grow in our own faith and equally as important, may we grow together as the church Christ has called us to be. And I believe when we pay attention to our own spiritual conditions, how we are doing as individual followers of Jesus. And when we commit to allowing God to help us grow in our faith, in our walk with Christ, then the church is just going to grow naturally, right? And I'm not too concerned about numbers. I mean folks who are on fire who are excited about what God is doing in and around us. And so may we be those people. Amen? In the name of our creating, redeeming, and sustaining God. Amen. As the children come back up and make their way into the sanctuary, I invite you to stand as you are able, stand in body or in spirit, and join with me as we recite the Apostles' Creed. It's number 881 in your hymnals. The words are also on the screen. Let us join together now. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. That clock is five minutes back, so I'm doing great. I'm doing great. There are so many needs in our community of faith. There are so many people all around us who are hurting, who are grieving the loss of loved ones, who are dealing with serious health issues, families that are struggling to get along. There are so many needs. I don't know what needs you have brought in here this morning. I want to ask you to continue lifting up Richard and Mary. These are difficult days. Hospice, Richard is on hospice care. And he's really tired. So hold them extra close in your prayers this week. <laughs> I think of Kay and all she's going through. <coughs> she's got five more chemo treatments, I believe, and so she's got a long road ahead of her. And she's tired. 
So remember Jerry and Kay in your prayers. And I know there are so many others who are going through serious health challenges. And you may know of others. And I know some of you have, have had to bury loved ones and are grieving the loss of loved ones, family, friends. Pat and Butch are out of town attending his sister's service, which is tomorrow. And so keep them in your prayers. And uh, one thing I know, God hears our prayers. God hears the prayers of God's people. And God is faithful to draw near. Sickness and death are challenging to deal with, aren't they? And it is in those times that we often have serious theological questions. And perhaps the biggest question at times is why? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know. But I do know that God is faithful. I mean, I can give you a theological answer. We can go there. But at the end of the day, it's about God's faithfulness in those times. It's about a God who hurts when we hurt. A God who's big enough for our questions. A God who's big enough for our anger and our disappointment. And so let us go to that God, that faithful God, that God who is holding us all in the palm of God's hand. Let us go to God in prayer. Holy and faithful God, we thank you for hearing the prayers of your people for being a God who is closer to us than our hands, feet, or even breath. And when we are hurting, when we are going through pain, when our brothers and sisters in Christ are going through pain and our hearts hurt for them, you are a God who is there. You are a God who is right there with us. And so may we experience your peace. Remind us once again of your steadfast love. Remind us once again of your presence. And may your Holy Spirit hold each of us tightly. And especially those who are hurting and grieving and suffering right now. May your Holy Spirit draw especially near to those. And may they feel the prayers of your people lifting them up this morning. We are told in scripture that when Jesus heard the news of Lazarus, Jesus wept. And so we know that you are a God of tender love and mercy. God, hear us. Now, as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. I think we've got time to sing our last hymn. <laughs> I think we need to sing our last hymn. Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, number 133 in our United Methodist hymnals. Uh, we will sing the first and last verses of that hymn. Stand as you are able. And as soon as we finish that hymn, you're dismissed. Leave your offering if you brought your tithe and offering in the plate on the table here in the hallway. And uh, go in peace. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. We hope to see you at the picnic. Let's lift our voices and sing. Most of the